Hello, welcome back to Compressible Flow. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be looking at wind tunnel applications using all our knowledge of isentropic flows and of course normal shock wave. We will look at a number of contemporary and historic wind tunnels just to give us a better idea of what they look like and how they're used in practice. I'll also talk about some particular examples of these flows to better illustrate the concepts, which you can work through on your own too if you wish. Now remember, a supersonic wind tunnel is one where a facility is producing for a particular controlled parameters of nozzle pressure ratio and temperature ratios and humidity through a test section, a Mach number greater than one, which is a controlled air stream in a laboratory for particular testing and research. And you'll find we use supersonic and subsonic wind tunnels for so many different facets of wind tunnels and research. Of course, it's true that in this class, which is aerospace class, we are going to focus on aerodynamics type research. Now, depending on the particular wind tunnel size, it generally uses a lot of energy and is often very much expensive. And we'll talk about examples of these class too. The largest supersonic wind tunnels in the world are often located in now in China, in the United States, and Russia at one particular location in the United States actually, which is the Arnold Engineering Development Center, the AEDC, at the Arnold Air Force Base to Homa, Tennessee, which indeed has a 4.7 meter test section. This means that the square test section is 4.7 meters wide and 4.7 meters high. So the rough cross-sectional area would of course be what? 4.7 squared. So this particular facility has some of the largest electric motors ever built in the world and in fact its own electric substation with enough power to light a small city. And so you see running these tunnels and their placement is often placed and located near large power sources. And in fact in World War II a lot of the German wind tunnels were located for eventual bombing by the Allies by looking where large power facilities are and looking for new construction. Nonetheless, Let's look at some examples. Here's the particular AEDC supersonic wind tunnel, which is no longer the largest in the world to my knowledge. On the left, you see a particular technician standing in the middle of the tunnel with a flashlight. And this is not, of course, a test section. This is one of the back turning vanes. You can see the turning vanes down at the end of the tunnel. And of course, the tunnel is very large, because of course, this is recirculating and all the air contracts. On the right, you can see the tunnel itself. Can you try and identify where the test section is? Of course, this is the upper part of the figure. You can see there's particular sections for compressors and turning vanes through the tunnel. Perhaps the smallest supersonic tunnel ever built in the world was actually done in a high school science project of a student in Tennessee in 1966. His particular tunnel section had a 0.5 by 1 inch cross section and indeed it was only powered by a half fourth horsepower motor but indeed he achieved a recirculating tunnel with a supersonic Mach number in it. Now this little tunnel only ran for a couple seconds but it did yield beautiful Schlieren images of supersonic flow in a particular nozzle. This is published in Scientific America in 1966 pages 120 and 125 if you're so curious. Here's the actual science student with his project on the left. You can see his little wind tunnel display. On the right, he actually made this diagram. So that's a schematic of his science fair. Now, there's different types of wind tunnels, and we'll talk about their particular classification. For continuously operating wind tunnels, the electric power requirement will go up exponentially with the size of the test section. That means they're running, and they can run for hours and they're usually recirculating. Now, if you want a very large test section, you want your tunnel to run continuously for days or hours or as long as you want, you'll of course need your own electrical substation to run, of course, the generators and compressors, excuse me, the compressors. Now, an intermittent supersonic tunnel usually runs for a few seconds, and it's much less expensive than, of course, you know, running and using energy all the time. In fact, Energy is used slowly to build up a high amount of compressed air, usually in a compressed bottle field or vacuum a vacuum chamber. And we'll look at examples of this shortly. These usually run on the order of minutes, if not five or six minutes, or down to a few seconds, like in the science experiment. 
In this particular flowchart on the bottom, you'll see we classify the supersonic wind tunnels. Supersonic wind tunnel classification, of course, there's continuous and intermittent. The continuous tunnels are often recirculating, and we'll call those closed circuit, or once through, which is, of course, where the ends of the wind tunnel are open. And they're very much impractical, and you won't see any large supersonic wind tunnels, which is continually drawing air from the atmosphere and running. It's very inefficient. The other major category, as I just noted, is an intermittent, where they run from a very short time to then on the order of minutes. And there's generally two kinds, or a combination of the two, which is called indraft and blowdown. Indraft wind tunnels exhaust the flow from the wind tunnel to a vacuum, and they're not recirculating. And the other kind of intermittent tunnel, which is not recirculating, is the blowdown tunnel, where you have a high pressure uh, total pressure, maybe in a large bottle field, which I'll show in a few minutes, which exhausts to the atmosphere. You can imagine you can combine the blowdown and indraft wind tunnels so you can exhaust your high pressure air through the test section and exhaust it indeed into a vac in the vacuum chamber. So the wind tunnels we just showed previously are indeed closed circuit continuous wind tunnels. Now let's talk about a particular intermittent wind tunnel. This one, of course, uses high Reynolds number and a small storage tank, which is easy to draw the air. Anytime you have supersonic flow, you wanna remove the humidity from the air. This, of course, as the pressure goes down, it might go down below the vapor pressure and you'll have a lot of water in your test section. I've been involved in experiments where you can watch water continually flow out of nozzles uh, during their and after their run. It's quite disturbing to see a lot of water in your wind tunnel, especially when you're dealing with different metals and it corrodes the tunnel. So there's certain good things about the blowdown tunnels. They're high Reynolds number and you can have a small storage tank and they're cheap. So you also often see small supersonic wind tunnels like at universities being blowdown types. There's very few universities with a continuous recirculating tunnel. The bad things about blowdown tunnels is that of course there's a very very high pressure hazard. You have a high pressure bottle field which might rupture and cause a safety problem. They're also extremely noisy, so they're not suited to aeroacoustic measurements. And of course, it's difficult to hold a constant total pressure as, of course, the tunnel exhausts. The other type of intermittent tunnel, of course, is the indraft tunnel. The good thing about these is there's no high pressure hazard, but of course, you have a vacuum chamber, which could also be a safety problem. Another good thing about these is that they're relatively quiet because, of course, once you have supersonic flow, you want to have acoustic waves going through the ducting system from downstream because acoustic waves can't travel upstream in the supersonic flow. So that's a good thing. They're very quiet. Unfortunately, they have a very limited Reynolds number capability because your total pressure is always going to be the atmospheric total pressure, which is just the atmospheric pressure. And you have, of course, a minimum vacuum pressure. So you have a very small range of pressure ratios in your particular tunnel. On their hand, they're also rather cheap. Now let's look at some particular tunnels to illustrate these concepts. Here's a particular blowdown tunnel. This one is in Novosibirsk in Russia. You'll see that there's an air inlet and it goes through a dryer which removes the air, humidity, and then the air goes through a compressor and it raises the pressure in the air and stores it in a high pressure storage tank. This high pressure storage tank is shown down here in what we call a bottle field. Each one of these is a high pressure tank which holds of course high pressure air. In this case there's 80 tanks, they're each 6 by 60 feet and they hold up to 20 atmospheres. And so of course your pressure ratio through the whole facility is 20, a maximum value. Then when the tunnel is on we open up a pressure regulator and valves which let of course the airflow go through this plenum. Turbulence is removed in the tunnel through a series of flow screens, and then we have the first nozzle. The flow goes from high pressure to, of course, the pressure in the test section, and the nozzle chokes the flow, and we have supersonic flow. Then, of course, the flow goes through the supersonic diffuser, which slows down the flow through pressure recovery and exhausts the flow into the atmosphere. Here's one particular picture, and I had the luxury of visiting this wind tunnel facility, and here's a few pictures from the internet of just the city it's in. So if you ever find yourself in Siberia, you can always drive out and try and see the tunnel yourself. Though I think the security people would be a little bit concerned about your visit. You can also go to the opera and the ballet uh, near Lenin Square, which is all very beautiful. 
Let's look at one American tunnel, which is the opposite of this Russian tunnel. This one, of course, is a um, tunnel which operates on a vacuum, which is non-recirculating. At NASA, one of the most famous pictures are, of course, these figures and spheres in figure 202, the NASA Langley vacuum spheres. In this particular picture, they're silver, but now they're painted white. There's a little bit of snow on them. What you see here are four smaller spheres and one large sphere, and this is where the flow exhausts in its particular vacuum. So before the facility starts running, they pump out all the air in the spheres and let the um, wind tunnel exhaust them. So before the wind tunnel is operating, they have a large vacuum pump which takes those large spheres and removes the air down to about zero atmospheres. Then they take the atmospheric air and let it exhaust after they open a valve into the vacuum sphere through particular screens in a dryer. This removes turbulence in the flow and they let the flow choke and go through the nozzle into the supersonic tuss section through a supersonic diffuser which slows down the flow into the sphere with, of course, the valve shut so the sphere is airtight. You can see these spheres here in the picture, and down in the lower right you see some cement structures. Inside those cement structures are where, of course, the test sections are. Since there's very high pressure and high speed air in these sections, uh, you can imagine that indeed um, there could be safety issues in the wind tunnel and they want to enclose them in cement structures so that if they blow up or rupture they won't hurt anybody. Interesting in this picture, you'll see in the lower left, there's actually a red brick building with another um, supersonic facility. In fact, the jet physics lab is in this building, which also draws high pressure and vacuum air sources. And that's one lab I used to be associated with when I was at NASA. Let's look at another particular type of wind tunnel. This one's in the DLR in Göttingen, Germany. And this is a closed circuit wind tunnel with a variable density continuous subsonic, transonic, and supersonic configurations. So there's three interchangeable test sections. You can see these interchangeable test sections go right here in the yellow area. And you can see the other interchangeable, interchangeable ones in the upper parts of the figure. And these are basically moved in and out depending on if they want to do subsonic, transonic, or supersonic tests. The supersonic tests, of course, have Laval nozzles. The transonic tests have perforated test sections, which I'll talk about later in the class. And the subsonic case might have an adaptive test section to try and target particular Mach numbers in the subsonic range. Now it's recirculating. So they have a 12 megawatt motor, which is electrically driven, that drives this compressor. At the corners of the tunnel, they have turning vanes to try and turn the flow as isentropically with as few losses as possible. They also have a cooler to try and control temperature of the air, and they have honeycombs and flow straighteners to remove turbulence in the flow before it goes through, of course, the first nozzle, and then it goes through the test section. And they have a little sting and um, balance here to measure aerodynamic forces on their device. And then there's another converging divergence section, which is rather small, and it comes out and exhausts back and turns around and goes in the clockwise direction that is the flow. In this particular case, you can even see that they have hydraulic rams to change the test section shape for the particular test. Here's another interesting picture of these compressors. So this is the axial compressor of a large continuous flow supersonic wind tunnel from the upstream direction. That means we're facing the direction in which the flow goes. And just to give you an idea of the size of these facilities, you can see one tiny little person in front of the compressor face. Here is a particular photo inside the AEDC wind tunnel, which we just showed earlier, perforated walls for a transonic type test. This is a particular F111 model, and you can see the scale of the test sections with the two people on the floor. Here's, of course, the sting. The sting holds the model, and of course, it can move around the model in the flow, and of course, find the forces on the model, much like you do in your aerospace labs. Here's one more fun picture. This is a variable area nozzle at the unit United States Air Force AEDC, and this is called Tunnel A. And we've already talked about these types of facilities, but just remember these are basically hydraulic rams, and you can see this is a particular second throat. The first throat is upstream to your right. And these, of course, change A1 soup star and A2 soup star so that you can swallow the shock, not disgorge it during runtime, and hit particular interesting supersonic Mach numbers in the test section. 
Now let's return to a little bit of analysis and look at different cases for supersonic wind tunnels with second throat diffusers. So there's particular cases. Let's look at case one. Let's say there's a fixed nozzle and the second throat. There's a fixed nozzle and the fixed nozzle is the second throat. The test section is shown and the second throat and first are shown in the lower figure on the page. So we want to establish a supersonic flow in the particular test section at the bottom. That means the second throat must be able as least, as least as our largest A2 soup star, because you know there's going to be a normal shock forming when we choke the first nozzle during startup. And that shock wave will reside in the test section at station one at one particular time. Now the overall pressure ratio must be sufficient to support the shock wave in the test section. Of course, we would never choke the flow in the first place. So in this case, the shock indeed is swallowed through as we raise the nozzle pressure ratio through the second point. So line one here is the startup, and we push by raising the nozzle pressure ratio to push that normal shock to two in the diagram below. So we call this the swallow location through the second position at two. And you can see it indeed has the same cross-section area as location one, which was the original location of the shock as we started the tunnel through the divergent portion of the nozzle. Now the nozzle pressure ratio can be decreased if we wish to move the shock back to position three at the second throat. This would be very much ideal because the shock wave strength would be lower because this is lower Mach number and we would have less entropy loss in our tunnel. Remember the shock waves which are normal have huge entropy increases and therefore large total pressure decreases, which is bad for our tunnel, it costs us more money. So it's always more ideal for cost savings to have your normal shock near the second throat as possible. So this is the most efficient wind tunnel run running condition for fixed nozzles with the second throat. We can only vary the nozzle pressure ratio to adjust the location of the second throat. Now the second throat indeed will work as a diffuser as needed because the normal shock will be above or near Mach 1.5 in practice if it's at position two. And this is of course expensive and wasted energy in terms of P naught. Now, Adolf Boosman was another interesting person who of course came over from Europe and he worked at NASA Langley. There's his picture in figure 209 of the slide jack holding one of his particular designs for the United States Air Force. In fact, I used to live in Hampton, Virginia and I recognize that house and street. Nonetheless, Adolf Boosman's supersonic wind tunnel from the early 1930s was the world's first practical supersonic wind tunnel. And in fact, this was developed in uh, Germany at the time. And it had a second adjustable second throat. So instead of varying nozzle pressure ratio, he would start the tunnel with a second throat being very large. And as the tunnel was running, they would actually decrease the area of the second throat. This was way more efficient and allowed us to have whatever Mach numbers we want in the test section because of course, we could adjust NPR and the test section cross-sectional areas by adjusting it. So he's indeed best known for having invented the idea of the swept back wing also. So you can see this is him actually pointing to his swept back wing. So in the United States and Germany, he really came up with this idea, but it was of course found theoretically in Russia before then. Let's look at a second case for wind tunnels with particular diffusers. In this case, unlike the first one where we have two fixed nozzles, we'll have a fixed nozzle and a variable area diffuser. Now in this case, in order to establish the supersonic flow, the second throat may be totally opened up to be as large as possible. So they would open up the second throat in Boosman's wind tunnel. Then with a nozzle pressure ratio increasing, a supersonic flow will be choked in the nozzle and it'll increase more and it'll send that normal shock wave and be swallowed by a very, very large second throat to a position downstream of the second throat. This will allow us to adjust the second throat by closing it with the hydraulic devices to a smaller and smaller value so that the shock wave will be moved upstream just after the second throat of the supersonic diffuser. Alternatively, we can in combination decrease the overall pressure ratio to move the shock back to the second throat with a Mach number of course is headed the second shock and will be low and have a small loss. This is the most efficient wind tunnel operating condition for a fixed nozzle and variable second throat, which is much more efficient than the first case. 
which of course saves us large amounts of money. Because remember, we're drawing power to run one of these tunnels, which is equivalent to like powering a small city. Now there's a third case, and this is where we might have a variable nozzle and a variable area second throat. And this is why in some of the pictures I've shown, they have hydraulic rams to change the tunnel walls as the tunnel is running at the nozzle and supersonic diffuser. So there's both adjustable nozzle and adjustable second throat can be closed simultaneously if we wish to raise the test section Mach number while keeping the normal shock downstream of the second throat in an optimal location. Indeed, this allows our test section Mach number for a given overall pressure ratio to be whatever we want. You can see if we can control the area ratios of the nozzle and diffuser, then this will be not only optimal and wonderful, but it's also extremely expensive to create these types of tunnels, which is problematic. So it's much more common to see a fixed nozzle that's interchangeable, like in the German facility, and a varying supersonic diffuser, and because it's, of course, it's less expensive. Here's one more picture to get an idea of this. Here, in this case, you have a variable area test section, throat and diffuser downstream in the particular test section. A few more fun photos. This is a photo of me at the NASA Langley Unitary Wind Tunnel, and you can see they actually have two different recirculating tunnels. This is on the test section, but these are the recirculating ducts, and they could actually send air through one or the other with interchangeable valves and turning vanes through the test section to achieve different ranges of Mach numbers. There I am in the lower left holding my coffee with my good friend Dr. Jeremy Velton of NASA. Um, that was a fun day, of course. Here we are at the test section, the attorney test section itself. So you can see in here, there's tiny little chairs for, uh, you know, because you have to duck down and get in there to install models. This is a sting without a model on. And of course, this giant blue thing here is the door and that swings closed and we would bolt it shut through all these little holes. There once again is my friend, Dr. Velton, and there's me in the black coat um, when I was a NASA employee. Some quick thoughts regarding what we have seen from these wind tunnels. The supersonic wind tunnels with large cross sections will require immense power. The diffusers in the wind tunnels are very important for reducing this power requirement. And also the blowdown or intermittent tunnels will reduce wind runtime, unfortunately, but require very little power and are much cheaper to build. Let's look at some schematics of these blowdown tunnels. Here's a particular blowdown tunnel where, of course, we have a vacuum tank and a test section. You can see there's no diffuser in the test section, so it's rather inefficient. You can improve this design by, of course, saying there's some diffuser. In this case, we have a shock wave in the diffuser, which will increase efficiency and increase runtime, and maybe have a larger vacuum chamber also to increase it. Now, wind tunnels will contain isentropic flow through the diffuser, which will provide some pressure recovery. Ideally, the diffuser will be completely isentropic, but you see in practice, normal shock waves form the tunnels and we have to place them exactly at the correct location of the diffuser. Typically, a blow down supersonic wind tunnel provides relatively short test times, and therefore efficient diffusers are important so we can increase that test time. Now, we would like to resolve short test times by making recirculating tunnels or continuously closed tunnels, which of course can run continuously, which overcomes that intermittent problem. You'll also see that they indeed save energy, but obviously they're more expensive and complicated. Here's the most basic diagram of a recirculating tunnel with turning vanes, a single compressor, and a single test section, which can indeed, if you wish, only have a single convergent divergent nozzle in the test sections here. But this would be a horrible design. Why? Because of course, there's no second diffuser. But these turning vanes, which you'll see in actual tunnels when you go out and visit them, actually try and increase efficiency by reducing the circulation and straightening the flow out through the corners. They're carefully designed. Remember, wind tunnels start up. The circulating tunnels will indeed be the most efficient with the diffuser's help and pressure recovery. The startup of the tunnel is extremely complicated as you've seen, and a lot of things can happen and sometimes they're bad. For example, if your shock disgorges, it could break apart your model. In fact, sometimes models are placed in the wind tunnel after the wind tunnel started, especially in hypersonic and high-speed supersonic facilities. 
Now, at the wind tunnel startup time, only a small pressure difference will be maintained and then increased. This increase of the pressure from the compressor or opening of the valves and the pressure control mechanisms will increase the pressure from the compressor forces and a normal shock will form at the test section inlet as we mentioned. This is shown again in figure 218 as we start up the tunnel. Now remember, we'll still have subsonic flow in the tunnel and there's no shocks. As we raise that and increase the compressor speed in the recirculating case, the shock will move downstream with increasing pressure ratio. We want to remove that shock from the tunnel, ideally, but we can't in practice. We can't have a truly isentropic tunnel, especially when we place a test article in it. So the second throw area, remember, must be large enough for the shock to be propagated and pushed down through the float throat for it to be swallowed. And then we could lower the pressure ratio and change the areas of the diffuser to get the shock close enough location at the second throat. Here's our summary of the shock location. We would like that normal shock wave to be located exactly at the throat of the diffuser. Unfortunately, the shock might move around a little bit and it might get pushed upstream past the throat and disgorge through the tunnel. However, if we can keep that as close to the throat as possible, say shock Mach number 1.05, then the shock strength will be minimum and will have minimal losses and save a lot of money when operating the tunnel. The shock Mach number, of course, will be near unity in that location, which is good, and we'll have a good pressure recovery. So here's the normal shock at perhaps the worst location in a tunnel operating supersonically. It might be very far down in the diffuser and you have a very high Mach number and large entropy losses and pressure losses. You might also look at this figure and you'll see here we've drawn the ideal operation of a tunnel in reality where the shock wave is located just downstream of the nozzle throat. Let's look at one particular example now of the problem at hand for a tunnel. A continuous supersonic wind tunnel is designed with test section Mach number of 2. That means we want M equals 2 inside the tunnel. The ratio of specific heats is 1.4 and C sub P, the coefficient of specific heat at constant pressure is 1.004 kilograms per kilogram Kelvin. The wind tunnel is started and is run for tests. The test section diameter is 0.25 meters, that's 25 centimeters in a circular tunnel. And we're asked to find the power requirements of this tunnel when we start it and when it's run continuously. We will define the study run as when the shock stands in the diffuser throat, which is of course at A2 soup star, or AT2. And the worst case is when the shock stands in the test section, which is startup. And we want to see the power requirement differences. So startup is the worst case, of course, because it loses the most energy and it's going to cost us the most money. And so we would have that shock wave located in the test section. In this case, we would have PO2 over PO1 goes as 0.7209, which is equal to A1 soup star over A2 soup star, which of course is the areas of the throats. And therefore, for startup, the area over the area of the test section star is 1.6875. We can then find the throat area of the particular diffuser, because we don't know it yet. We can write out by expansion, AT2 is equal to AT2 divided by AT1 times AT1 over A test star times AT test star over A test times A test. We know A test and we know these particular ratios now. We'll find 1 over 0 0.729, 1 because of course it's choked, and 1 all over 1.6875. That will be found to be 0 0.4035 meters squared. Now during the study operations, the mass flow rate for the test section is a value we already found. Remember, m dot equals rho AU. We'll replace rho with the ideal gas law. A remains the same, and U becomes, of course, the definition of Mach number and the speed of sound. M equals U over C, and C equals the square root of gamma RT. So we can write U as M times square root of gamma RT. You'll now find a particular pressure of 5.5 kPa and temperature of 216.7 Kelvin from the particular standard day tables for operating the tunnel at sea level. We can now solve for the mass flow rate. The mass flow rate will be about, say, 5.5 over R 287 times T, P over RT. 
area, we know pi over 4 times diameter squared times the Mach number, which is 2, times square root of gamma RT, see in 485, 1 1.4 times 287 times, of course, 216.7 Kelvin. And we'll get a mass solar to 2.5619 kilograms per second. So at this particular Mach number at 2, we can go on our isentropic tables and find T over T0 at 0 0.5556. And so therefore, this test stagnation condition, we know temperature and Mach number, will be 390 Kelvin. So that's one part of the problem. Now at the steady conditions, A over A soup star at T2 will be 1.3872. And therefore, we can find the Mach number at 2 from, of course, Mach number 2, which will be 1.7506. And we would have to solve this equation, of course, with Newton rafts and iteration, which we discussed previously in this class. Now across the shock wave itself, we'll have a total pressure loss at this particular condition, which is PO2 divided by PO1 of 0.8343 from that particular Mach number MT2. Now the compressor must overcome the losses in delta P naught. That's its whole job in life. So from the compressor in the, of course, first law of thermodynamics, the work will go as the change of the enthalpy. So we can write that as C sub P times T, ma, T0 minus Ti, which is temperature outlet minus temperature inlet. Now if there's no losses through the rest of the system, and the rest, all the losses are only across the shock, we can write T0 over Ti goes as P0 over Pi to the gamma minus 1 over gamma, which is an isentropic relation across the rest of the tunnel. Then we can say the work of the compressor must go as C sub P times 20.7197, which is the temperatures we found at the inlet and outlet of the test section, will go as 20.8065 kilojoules per kilogram. Now the power goes as M dot, the mass flow rate, times the work. And that goes as 2.5619 times 20.8026 kilojoules per kilogram, and we'll get 53.2941 kilowatts. So that's our power during continuous run. Now during our startup, remember, we found a total pressure loss of 0 0.7209. We can then find, of course, the work, which is Cp delta T, goes as 1.04 times 38.2276, which we found from the temperature during startup. And we'll find, of course, approximately 38.3805 kilojoules per kilogram. Once again, we find the power. The power is m dot w. The m dot is 2.5619 times the work for startup, 38.305 kilojoules per kilogram. And startup power will be 98.3269 kilowatts. So you can see the power required by the compressor during normal run operations, continual run for steady state supersonic flow is 53.3 kilowatts. The power required to start the tunnel is 98.3 kilowatts. That represents about a 40, uh, 45 kilowatt difference. So you can see in this case, that's actually, if you do the calculation, 84.5% more power required to start the tunnel. And so starting the tunnel requires a lot more power. And if we left our shockwave the least optimal case, we would continue to run at about 100 kilowatts uh, for continuous running, which is a moderate amount of energy. At this point in the class, I usually like to show a particular videos, and I'll try and show these in our offline discussions. In this class, we looked at a number of wind tunnel pictures and terminology and how they're started up in practice. We then defined the so-called blowdown or intermittent tunnels and also continuous tunnels which are running supersonically. We illustrated graphically how we started a wind tunnel and then we estimated a basic power requirement for a particular small 25 centimeter wind tunnel. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.